How heavy is the largest living snake? How can a snake eat a whale? Get ready, I'm about to answer these questions. Before the last ice age, giant mammals like mammoths ruled the world. The modern animal kingdom we're familiar with was shaped around 55 million years ago. I mean, there were still 1,000 pound bear dogs living from Asia to America. But modern whales, for instance, began to appear later. I'm saying modern whales because, surprise, surprise, whales weren't always fully aquatic. The ancestors of the ocean's biggest animals once walked on dry land. They had four legs and lived on the coast. Now, I want to introduce you to a snake that used to eat these whales, the Palaeophys, a genus of a marine snake. Scientists say it's hard to understand how big the Palaeophys was due to its fragmentary fossil record. They assume that it could have reached up to 40 feet long. Its fossils were found in different parts of the world, from England to Morocco and Virginia, USA. The Phileophys is extinct now, and sea snakes today are only about a quarter of the size this majestic creature used to be. So no need to worry about this underwater monster. But there once was an even bigger snake, the Titan Boa. It was around 50 feet long and most likely weighed over a ton. It used to live in what is now known as northeastern Colombia around 60 to 58 million years ago. Scientists say that it mostly fed on fish. Another giant animal that lived in the past was the black Gigantopithecus. These primates aren't related to gorillas. They lived in the area of modern China. Some people believe that they're still alive, but so far, no one has laid eyes on them. Some people even go further and say that the stories of Bigfoot or Yeti are based on these animals. This rodent became extinct about 2 million years ago. Its main habitat was South America, more specifically, Uruguay. What's astonishing about this species is that it was the largest rodent ever known. It was bigger than a bull. Scientists believe that it weighed up to 1,000 pounds. A distant relative of this rodent is still alive today. It's called the Pacarana. It's a rare animal that lives in South America. It weighs up to 33 pounds and measures up to 31 inches, not including its cute and fluffy tail. The Arthropleura was an insect that lived in prehistoric times. Imagine a giant millipede measuring up to 8 feet in length. Here you go. It was one of the largest land animals of its era, about 315 million years ago. The Arthropleura's shell was covered with tough plates. These plates were there to protect the creature from damage. Most of the time, it burrowed into the ground to avoid becoming some other animal's dinner. Meet the Megalodon. Millions of years ago, this shark lived in the ocean and ate other marine creatures. It had wide teeth and its jaws were so powerful that the animal could finish off its prey with the force of its bite. It was one of the largest sharks to ever exist. Yet, this predator also went extinct. Scientists don't really know the reason. This made me wonder why animals were so big in the past. Nowadays, smaller creatures flee or hide from predators. But apparently, it wasn't like this before. Many centuries ago, animals didn't just run or hide, they fought back. Research suggests that this behavior may have been the most important motivation for prey to grow bigger. A study compared the skulls of ancient animals to those of their modern peers. The skulls of predatory animals have become shorter and narrower, while the skulls of the animals they hunted have become longer and broader. This means that predators learned to become experts in hunting, while prey worked on developing their defense skills. You see, a larger body size was a great advantage because it made it harder for predators to take down the animals they hunted. The bottom line? Self-defense made prehistoric animals larger. The second reason why ancient animals were larger is related to their bones. They had hollow bones, which are lighter than solid bones. This type of bone allowed large animals to move quickly. Let's take sauropods. They were a dinosaur subgroup. Sauropods had giraffe-like long necks and snake-like long tails. 
Compared to their body size, their head was really tiny. But since their bones were quite light, they could move around without having to carry additional weight. The eating habits of these animals were also related to their body size. When experts examined the fossils of one extinct mammal species, they found out that these animals had a diet that was high in nutrients and low in fiber. And this mammal was the largest land animal of its period. In other words, following this diet, mammals could grow to be very large. There was plenty of food out there, so they didn't have to worry about finding it. Fun fact, these animals also took chewing out of the picture. They could swallow their food in large pieces instead of taking small bites. Environmental conditions also played an important role in the evolution of larger animals in prehistoric times. Those animals tended to live in warm, moist climates that provided them with a lot of food. They didn't have to compete for food sources. Researchers believe that because of these conditions, natural selection worked in a certain way. I mean, body size was more important than such traits as agility and speed. Oh, and did you know that large animals tend to produce more carbon dioxide? And ultimately, a bigger volume of carbon dioxide increases the amount of vegetation in the animal's habitat. As for the abundance of oxygen in the atmosphere at that time, it could be another vital element for some animal's growth. A good but scary example of an animal that benefited from the high levels of oxygen can be the cockroach of the Paleozoic era. At that time, cockroaches were the size of modern house cats. Now this one would give me the chills if I ever faced it. Ugh. What about today? Well, there are over 3,000 species of snakes on Earth. The smallest snake in the world is the Barbados thread snake. It's only around 4 inches long when fully grown. And the largest one? It's the reticulated python. This snake reaches around 20 feet in length. The longest python was discovered in 1912. It measured 32 feet long. As for the largest and heaviest reticulated python, it was named Medusa. Medusa was approximately 25 feet long and weighed 350 pounds. These reptiles lived in Southeast Asia in rainforests, woodlands, and grasslands. Don't be confused though, the reticulated python isn't the heaviest snake in the world. This title belongs to the green anaconda. It weighs approximately 500 pounds. Green anacondas are found in South America and Trinidad in damp, humid areas. I have a bonus for you. Here is a flying snake. You can find these snakes in Southeast Asia. They don't fly like birds, of course, but they do use the power of flight. They can go as high as 300 feet. They leap from tree branches into the air. Once they take off, it's all about aerodynamics. Their main technique is flaring their ribs and pulling in their abdomens. While airborne, they undulate from one side to another and slightly up and down. This motion helps snakes to turn and glide. Why bother with all this if they can just crawl in an old school way? Scientists aren't sure, but they believe it might be related to escaping from predators. This way, they move from one tree to another without having to get down to the ground. Every now and then, people discover fossils of animals that lived millions of years ago. These ancient discoveries continue to capture our imagination. Which of these animals would you like to see alive? Now, if Earth's history were a movie, we humans would only take up the last second of the end credits. Our planet has been around for about 4.6 billion years, but our human story began about 300,000 years ago, in Africa. Now our ancestors had some wild adventures in nature. They could have run into creatures so big, they'd make today's elephants look like puppies. The woolly mammoth is a pretty famous animal, sure. His cousin, though, the Colombian mammoth, not so much. This giant used to roam places from Canada all the way down to Mexico. Unlike the furrier woolly mammoths, which hung out in colder places, these animals had shorter hair, resembling huge elephants. They also had incredibly large tusks, like 12 feet worth of spiraling sturdy tusks. And they weren't just for show, they came in handy when facing predators. That includes our ancestors. 
If you think about sloths these days, you're picturing these adorably slow creatures. They couldn't possibly be in your list of most dangerous animals. Well, their grandparents might have. For starters, we call them ground sloths, and they vary a lot in size. Some were as big as rhinos, and others, like the megatherium, were as colossal as elephants. Imagine seeing a 20-foot-long sloth which doesn't mind chewing on some meat every now and then. At least in theory. Ever heard of Bigfoot? Well, our next animal kind of looks like him, but is a distant cousin to orangutans. Meet Gigantopithecus, the largest primate to ever call our planet its home. Standing tall at 10 feet and weighing more than 600 pounds, these animals were amazing to look at in real life. Unlike Bigfoot, they weren't constantly hiding. In fact, it's believed they were peaceful and gentle creatures. Sadly, they faded away about 100,000 years ago, mainly because their food sources slowly became unavailable. Those lush, fruity forests they called home eventually turned into dry grasslands. Next on our list is the cave hyena. Weighing a chunky 250 pounds and standing 3 feet tall, these beasts were as long as a grown-up lying down. What's even more interesting about these creatures is that they loved hanging out in groups. A pack could be as big as 30 of these animals, which meant they could easily take on even the biggest, heaviest mastodons. Our ancient families would have needed to stay alert around these hungry specimens. Sadly, for these hyenas about 20,000 years ago, their numbers started going down. Soon enough, they completely disappeared from the planet. Quick pop quiz. What's called a tiger but isn't really one? It's the saber-toothed tiger. I mean, sure, they belong to the feline family, but they aren't technically tigers. First appearing around 42 million years ago, in July, I think, many of their kind were gone before we even showed up. However, early Americans might have bumped into a couple of specimens from this group. If that really happened, it would have been quite the encounter. Think of the biggest wild lion today or the hefty Siberian tiger. These big cats also had some incredible features hidden in their fur. They were good at sneaking around, hiding, and pouncing on mammoths bigger than themselves. Their bite wasn't that strong, but they could open their jaws wide, like twice as much as a lion. And although their teeth were a bit on the weak side, they had buff forearms to pin down their dinner, giving those big fangs a purpose. Not the kind of kitty you'd want to play with. Dire wolves made their debut about 250,000 years ago. They were like the gray wolves we know today, but a lot stronger. While wolves these days stretch out to about 6 feet and tip the scales at 170 pounds max, dire wolves were about 5 feet and about 150 pounds. Found all over North and South America, they had admirable jaws, biting nearly a third harder than their modern counterparts. Also, their favorite snack was horses. But just like many other majestic beasts of the past, they faded away around 10,000 years ago. Now, names can be deceiving. Take the American lion, for example. It's not really a lion, it's more of a panther's big cousin. The other part of the name is correct, though. They did live in America about 330,000 years ago. This feline was no lap cat either. They were at the top of the wildcat pyramid, weighing a colossal 772 pounds. That's like stacking four grown men on a scale. Even the mighty African lion would look a tad bit shy beside these beasts. With the muscle to take down a bison, you wouldn't want to accidentally interrupt their dinner. They parted ways with this planet around 11,000 years ago, right after the last ice age. Now, down in Australia, about 50,000 years ago, I wasn't around then, there lurked a relative of the Komodo dragon, the Megalania. Experts love to have debates on how big it was. Some say it stretched out to 23 feet. Others think it was just about 11 feet long. Either way, they were basically mega-sized Komodo dragons with a dangerous bite. If you think bears are already big and fluffy now, let's introduce the short-faced bear. While this big creature stood on its hind legs, it towered at 14 feet. With long limbs, they could outrun today's bears, hitting speeds up to 40 miles per hour. These ultra bears sadly disappeared around 11,600 years ago. 
Now, imagine a crocodile. Okay, imagine that same crocodile, only supersized, with sporty legs doing its thing in Australia about 1.6 million years ago. Well, say hello to the Quincana. These crocs were extremely large, reaching 23 feet. And no, they weren't lazy river loungers. These creatures really love spending time on land. They evolved to have strong legs for their chases and razor-sharp teeth designed for slicing, not gripping. When did we stop sharing beaches with them? About 40,000 years ago. The name elephant bird might not sound familiar, but try to picture a bird that stood tall as high as a basketball hoop at 10 feet and weighed as much as a small car, 1,500 pounds. Their eggs were equally huge, like 150 chicken eggs bundled up into one. Now, as amazing as these birds sound, there's a lot we still don't know about them. They're hard to study, as most extinct animals are. Still, some recent studies have given us some clues. Scientists have been examining ancient molecules from their fossilized eggshells. It's an awesome piece of evidence, since these birdie shells were thick, preserving precious DNA inside. Plus, there are tons of these eggshell fragments sprinkled all over Madagascar's beaches. Because of these findings, we now know these birds were herbivores and loved eating leaves and seeds. We also know the tiny kiwi bird is its closest living relative. Now, dodos were these amazing birds we also used to share the planet with. They're like distant cousins to Asian pigeons. To give you some perspective, imagine a chunky bird weighing about 50 pounds. Similar to chickens, turkeys, and ostriches, dodos were also the types of birds that couldn't fly. Their wings were small, and they had the muscle strength of, well, a wet noodle. Now, you might have heard the word dodo used as a name for creatures that aren't that bright. Don't get confused, though, by this name. These birds were, in fact, intelligent. Scientists were able to figure that out by studying their fossils. It turns out that they were good at smelling stuff, unlike most birds that are all about the visuals. These creatures aren't around for us to study anymore, but that might change. One evolutionary biologist is on a mission to fully understand these amazing ancient birds. On that note, she revealed that the dodo's DNA has been completely sequenced. There are even talks about potentially bringing dodos back to life. They would make a nice addition to the lovely beaches of Mauritius, the place they used to call home many, many years ago. Researchers have been waiting for this find for a long time. They came in all shapes and sizes. It would have been hard to distinguish them from dinosaurs. Most species weren't bigger than a mouse. It's like a reminder of a long-gone era when its ancestors walked on all fours. The first mammals to walk the Earth were different from us humans in one important aspect. We walk on two legs. That makes us bipedal. But the first animals that made the transition from sea to land were tetrapods. This means they walked on four legs. The story of these creatures began in present-day Scotland. The region is home to the first terrestrial ecosystem in the world. The rock here is made from silica. This material is the building block of glass. Hot volcanic springs formed these rocks more than 400 million years ago. Such land composition is a treasure trove for paleontologists. These are the scientists who study the fossil remains of animals and plants. In Scotland, they found everything from plants with preserved cells to the oldest known fossils of insects. They even discovered a fungus that grew up to 29 feet tall. But there was one find that stood out from all the other ones. In 2015, scientists unearthed fossils of four-legged animals. The place of discovery was Willie's Hole, near the hillside village of Chernside in the south of the country. Researchers dated the finds to the Paleozoic era, about 360 million years ago. This was the time when the early ancestors of the dinosaurs thrived. The world was a much different place back then. Today, we associate Scotland with cold and rain, and kilts and golf. But at that time, this land sat closer to the equator. It had lush vegetation, and its climate was hot and humid. Droughts and flooding were quite common. It was the perfect setting for an important evolutionary event. 
Researchers have been waiting for this find for a long time. The fossil records had a 15 million year gap. Its name was Romer's Gap, after the Harvard professor who described it. Science was missing fossil evidence of the animals that ventured onto land on all fours. The five fossil species they found in Scotland shed light on this mystery. The first tetrapods were divided into two large groups. One of them contained the ancestors of birds, reptiles, and mammals. Their collective name is Amniotis. The other included the ancestors of amphibians, such as frogs. When these and similar species migrated to dry land, they discovered that they weren't alone. The earliest life forms that made this evolutionary leap were liverwort-like plants. We know this because scientists found their spores. They also discovered fossilized remains of an air-breathing millipede. It had tiny holes that allowed it to breathe air. This puts it among the first oxygen-breathing animals on the planet. And this species of millipedes is the first land-dweller in the animal kingdom. Today, the largest of such creatures is the African elephant. Scientists believe that one of the first four-legged creatures to make it onto land was an amphibian ancestor. Its name was Istiostega. The first part of the animal's name translates from ancient Greek as fish. This reveals a lot about the way the creature moved. It dragged itself on the ground using only its front limbs that resembled fins. This is the way that mudskipper fish move on land today. This isn't how we imagine proper walking, but during the period our hero lived on Earth, it was the perfect way to get around. The climate had both extremely dry and wet periods. The ability to walk and swim at the same time was especially useful. The fossils from Scotland supported this claim. The fish-like animals scientists found had four slender limbs. This is the perfect equipment for life on land, not inside the ocean. There was further evidence. The fossils displayed well-developed lungs for breathing outside of water. But their legs were still too weak to completely lift the body off the ground. The tail section had to slither along the surface, similar to how a snake moves forward. This animal that resembled a modern-day salamander lived during the Paleozoic era. This was the time when four-legged creatures developed a standard number of digits at the end of their hands and feet, five on each. We know them today as fingers. All species that had more than five fingers started slowly disappearing. These pteropods split into two groups. The first of them had to return to the sea to lay eggs. This group would later give rise to amphibians. The second kind of tetrapods is more interesting to human evolution. They're considered the ancestors of reptiles, dinosaurs, and mammals. The Permian period came at the end of the Paleozoic. By this time, all life forms on Earth inhabited the supercontinent of Pangaea. There were vast deserts far away from the oceans. The more important species that walked on all fours during this time were the synapsids. They came in all shapes and sizes. But the only subgroup of synapsids to survive into the Cenozoic were the mammals. Doesn't seem like much, but we exist today thanks to these ancient tetrapods. As a species, we have come far in the tree of life. A recent study revealed that the first life form to evolve was an ocean-drifting comb jelly. This came as a bit of a surprise. For a long time, researchers believed that the simple sponge was the oldest animal on the planet. After analyzing vast amounts of data, comb jelly came on top. Or the bottom, depending on how you look at the tree of life. These ancient beings were squishy and had tentacles, but they weren't the true jellyfish like the ones we see today. The creatures lacked the bell-shaped body and stinging cells. Scientists cannot precisely date the species because they lack a fossil of the oldest comb jelly. This is not the case with other ancient creatures that once roamed our planet. The ancestor of dinosaurs, turtles, and crocodiles are familiar to science. These are the animals that appeared during the Paleozoic era. This was a time when true tetrapods appeared. Paleontologists recognized them by two distinctive openings on each side of their skull. The first mammals that appeared during this era resembled reptiles. It would have been hard to distinguish them from dinosaurs. Some of them later evolved features we all know today. These include fur and a warm-blooded metabolism. They developed during the time when dinosaurs dominated Earth. 
That's why these first true mammals were small. Most species weren't bigger than a mouse. Their diet consisted of plants, as they were herbivores. Also, they were creatures of the night. During the day, they were mostly hiding underground. Now, this wasn't such a bad strategy. Some 66 million years ago, an asteroid fell on the Yucatan Peninsula in today's Mexico. And this spelled the end for dinosaurs. 75% of all species that lived on Earth at the time disappeared. The mammal's small size helped them survive and repopulate the planet. The era in the history of our planet that followed the Mesozoic was nicknamed the Age of the Mammals. The climate became warmer, so grasslands expanded. These were the ideal conditions for tetrapods to grow in size. Some mammals decided not to take this evolutionary path. Bats remained relatively small in size and took to the skies to join birds. And there are some tetrapods that return to the ocean. The most notable example are whales. Today, their closest living relatives are hippos. Both species are aquatic, but they develop this trait separately. The first whales were actually tetrapods. These were the most typical examples of four-legged land animals. If you saw them today, you would think they were oversized rats. That's what whales looked like some 50 million years ago. Paleontologists came to this conclusion in the 1980s by studying the skull of a now-extinct animal. It lived around the edge of a large, shallow ocean. At some point in history, it returned to the marine way of life. Its back legs devolve. But sometimes, biologists stumble upon a living specimen of a whale that still displays tiny hind limbs in its skeleton. It's like a reminder of a long-gone era when its ancestors walked on all fours. Texas is home to some of the oddest, creepiest, and most unusual animals you've ever heard of. It might come as a surprise, but this state is full of creatures you'll hardly see in other places. So, let's have a look at the most amazing ones. This truly beautiful bright blue creature is called the Blue Sea Dragon. Despite such an imposing name, the critter is actually tiny. Usually no bigger than a grape. You may find it on the beach or floating beside you in the water. Now, you need to remember one thing. However pretty this little slug may look, never ever touch it. One tourist spotted a few of these pretty dragons on the shore of Mustang Island. He scooped one of the creatures up. He wanted to film it. Luckily, he put it back into the water before it could sting him. Otherwise, it would have ended badly since the blue sea dragon is venomous. Despite their tiny size, their sting can pack a punch. All because of their diet. Their favorite dish is the Portuguese man o' war a jellyfish that has enough venom to paralyze small fish and crustaceans. The blue dragons first use mucus to neutralize the jellyfish's infamous stinging cells. And then they steal these cells from the man o' war's tentacles and store and concentrate them within their own tissues. Then they release these stinging cells on contact, which makes their own sting more powerful, even worse than that of the man o' war itself. These awesome creatures are also extremely sneaky. Even though their appearance is bright, to say the least, they're well-known masters of disguise. You see that vibrant blue coloring is actually on their bellies. And when they float on their backs, they simply blend with the water. As for their backs, they're gray to camouflage these animals on the seafloor. Now, how about a funny fact? A group of tiny dragons floating together is called a blue fleet. And another fact. Blue dragons normally lay a string of around 16 eggs, and it takes them three days or so to hatch into larvae. Blue sea dragons rarely make it to the shore. They're soft-bodied, so when the animals finally get through the surf zone and are deposited on the shore, they're already broken apart. And still, watch out! Even in this case, the venom in their bodies doesn't dissipate. But of course, blue sea dragons aren't the only unusual animals inhabiting Texas. Have a look at this nightmarish creature. Poisonous, slimy, and kinda immortal. Meet the hammerhead worm. The worst thing? It might be lurking in your garden while you're watching this video. You can easily recognize this worm by its creepy spade-shaped head. 
it doesn't look like any other invertebrate you've ever seen. Or any other creature, that is. At first, it was only found in East Texas. But later, researchers spotted these spine-chilling creatures in North, Central, and South Texas. Basically everywhere but the arid areas of West Texas. One of the most terrifying things about this worm might be its length. This creature can grow as long as one foot. Luckily, such giants aren't very common. Most hammerhead worms only reach 6 inches in length. You can come across two species of these worms in Texas, and both of them will have a dark stripe down the middle. The larger of these two species munches on earthworms, which is actually a big problem. You might know that earthworms play an important role in keeping the soil rich in minerals and overall healthy. If earthworms disappear, plants in such areas won't be getting the nutrients they need. Even for humans and pets, meeting a hammerhead worm isn't the most pleasant experience either. Hammerheads are the only terrestrial invertebrates that secrete a very dangerous neurotoxin, the same as pufferfish produce. Thanks to the sheer size of the human body, touching a hammerhead worm won't hurt you too much, but it may still cause your hand to start tingling or even go numb. It's much more dangerous for pets. There have been cases when dogs ate hammerheads, which left them feeling sick for the whole day. Interestingly, these worms are native to Southeast Asia. But they must have mastered the art of hitchhiking, since in the early 1900s, they were already found in the U.S. Keep in mind that if you want to get rid of a hammerhead worm, which is the best course of action, the worst thing you can do is chop it with a shovel. The thing is, Flatworms reproduce by ripping themselves in half, so by cutting it, you actually help the populations of the worms, turning one into two. That's the reason why hammerheads are sometimes described as immortal, which is a bit of a stretch since these creatures can't survive in vinegar or salt. Now even though you're safe from the hammerhead worm in West Texas, it doesn't mean you can't come across another dangerous animal, such as the land lobster from hell. These creatures are also known as vinegaroons, and they're not real crustaceans, they're arachnids! Huh? Who would have guessed? Anyway, these eight-legged critters have a really nasty bite, but it's not the worst thing about them. Land lobsters? Brace yourself! Spray vinegar-like 85% acid from their tails! Mostly they do it to protect themselves, but it still sounds like an unfriendly thing to do, right? A land lobster can also pinch a finger that's gotten too close with its heavy mouth parts. At the base of their abdomens, vinegaroons have long whip-like tails. That's why these arachnids are often called whip scorpions, even though they're neither related to scorpions nor have stingers. Summer rains lure these arachnids out of their burrows in search of food and love. Luckily, experts claim that land lobsters aren't poisonous to humans but they're very likely to leave a mark with their large pinchers, which they use to capture insects. Vinegaroons can be considered useful since they eat millipedes, crickets, scorpions, and cockroaches. They hunt by sensing the vibrations of their prey with those long front legs of theirs. Since land lobsters prefer to come out after dark, you aren't likely to see one in the daylight. But if you stumble upon one, check it out. If it's a female, it may be carrying her hatchlings on her back. Now, imagine it's the middle of spring and you're walking among blooming flowers and greenery. Suddenly, you spot something extremely bizarre on the ground. The animal looks cute, fluffy, and soft-looking. The desire to touch it is irresistible. Watch out! The sting of the hairy caterpillar can pack a serious punch. This one is called the pus moth caterpillar, or asp. There are several stinging caterpillar species in Texas. The buck moth caterpillar, spiny oak slug caterpillar, saddleback caterpillar, and eo moth caterpillar. And touching any of them can lead to unpleasant consequences. If you had touched that pretty hairy thing in the park, you'd most likely start feeling a burning sensation and develop an itchy rash. In the worst case scenario, you'd even have to go to the emergency room. 
The main problem is that people react very differently to caterpillar toxins. Some may develop more severe reactions than others. Plus, how bad the consequences are also depends on the thickness of the skin in the affected area. In most cases, the unpleasant sensation and rash go away in a few hours or sometimes days. On the bright side, such caterpillars later turn into moths and butterflies that help pollinate flowers and trees. Getting rid of these critters means doing a massive disservice to the area where you live. Specialists are sure that coming across a stinging caterpillar won't lead to anything bad if you keep in mind the rule of thumb. If a caterpillar looks fuzzy, don't touch it. And the best solution to dealing with such creatures is educating people on what such caterpillars are, what they look like, and why it's dangerous to touch them with unprotected hands. Alrighty, folks. Gather around and let me tell you about the Mananangal, a real charmer of a mythical creature from Filipino folklore. She's often described as a lady who likes to snack on sleeping pregnant women. But here's the twist. During the day, she's all dolled up and looking like a total babe. But come nightfall, she detaches her torso and spreads her massive bat-like wings to fly off into the darkness in search of her next victim. And she doesn't just stop at pregnant ladies. Nope. Sometimes she'll use her good looks to lead astray men and take them to her secret hiding spot where she'll feast on their heart, intestines, and other internal organs all night long. Yikes. If you're ever faced with a Mananangal and want to stop her from reattaching her body before sunrise, just sprinkle some salt, ash, or crushed garlic on the remaining half of her body. Easy peasy, right? So keep an eye out for this winged wonder and don't forget the garlic! Okay, so check this out. In German folklore, there's this crazy creature called an owl. Basically, it's like a vampire, mixed with an incubus. And it wears this dope hat called a tarn cap that gives it all kinds of powers. This dude is all about preying on women at night by messing with their dreams. Oh, and it's into breast milk and sucking the blood of men and kids. The Alp can shapeshift into all kinds of stuff, like cats, pigs, dogs, snakes, and even butterflies. And it's got this evil eye that can totally mess you up with bad luck or sickness. But don't worry, you can protect yourself by hiding a broomstick under your pillow, pointing your shoes towards the door, hanging iron horseshoes from the bedpost, or putting a mirror on your chest. And if all else fails, just leave the lights on all night and shove a lemon in its mouth if you catch it napping during the day. Meet the Pontia Nuck, a spooky ghost from Malay mythology. Legend has it that she was a woman who passed away while giving birth, and now she's out for revenge. She's not your average ghost either. She's got long black hair, sharp fingernails, and a blood-smeared white dress. But watch out, because she's also a master of disguise. She can transform into a beautiful woman to lure in her prey before ripping out their insides. If you're ever out at night and hear the cries of babies or feminine laughter, beware. That could be the Pontiana coming to get you. And if the sounds are quiet, she might be right around the corner. So keep your wits about you, and don't fall for any too-good-to-be-true ladies. Hey, did you know that according to Irish legend, every family has their very own banshee? This banshee lady is supposed to let out a piercing wail or shout when someone in the family is about to kick the bucket. Talk about a not-so-subtle warning, but don't let her eerie cry trick you. This banshee lady is said to be drop-dead gorgeous with long flowing locks and crimson eyes from all her crying. She's also known for wearing a gray shawl over her green threads. Fashionable and spooky? We're into it. Some people even say that this banshee can transform into a sweet singing young lady who foretells the doom of the family. Yikes. And if that's not enough to give you goosebumps, she's also been spotted hunched over in the woods, crying her eyes out at night. Sounds like a real party animal, doesn't she? So next time you hear a blood-curdling scream in the middle of the night, just remember, it might just be your friendly neighborhood banshee giving you a heads up. Now let me tell you about the Kalu Pillowit. These creatures are like the boogeyman of the Arctic. They live near the ice flows and are known for snatching up kids who get too close to the water. But don't worry, it's just a myth to keep children safe. Now, the appearance of these critters varies from story to story, but they all have some things in common. 
They've got slimy green skin, long hair, and long fingernails. Their hands are webbed like a fish, and they wear these fancy parkas made out of eider duck feathers. Oh, and watch out for their flippers. One of them can emit a sound that'll paralyze you. But don't fret, you can outsmart them. Some clever Inuit hunters figured out that if they asked the Kalupiluit to shapeshift into a seal or whale, they could easily finish it and bring home a tasty catch. Yum! Some stories say that these creatures use kidnapped children to keep their hair looking fabulous. Talk about dedication to hair care. Others say that the kids are just devoured or used to fuel the Kalapiluit's youth. But here's a wild tale for you. There was once a grandma who couldn't feed her grandson, so she called upon a Kalapiluit to take him away. The tribe eventually got back on their feet, and a young couple went to rescue the boy. They found him tethered to seaweed by the Kalapiluit. But every time they got close, she'd drag him back underwater. They ended up waiting until sunrise to cut him loose. Yeah, the Kalupiluit may be spooky, but they're just looking out for the kiddos. And who knows? Maybe they'll give you some hair care tips if you're lucky enough to meet one. Let me present to you the scariest horse-like monster in all of Scotland. The Nuklavi, or Nuklavi. This bad boy has a skinless body, a head ten times bigger than a human's, and a breath so poisonous it can destroy animals and crops. So, it's got wicked powers that can cause chaos all over the islands. But fear not, because there's an old spirit known as the Sea Mither who can control this terrifying beast during the summer months. The Nukalavi has roots in Norse and Orcadian folklore, and was first documented by the mysterious Joe Ben using some fancy Latin manuscripts back in the 16th century. Ernest Marwick, an Orcadian writer and folklorist, thinks that this evil sea creature is similar to the Norwegian Nock, the Nuggle of the Shetland, and the shape-shifting Kelpie, or Water Kelpie. So, if you're ever out and about in Scotland and come across this scary guy, just remember, call on the Sea Mither and run for your life. This dude is South African Tokolosha. It may look like a gremlin, but trust me, it's way more mischievous. Apparently, witches and shamans can summon them with their magical powers, but there are ways to keep these troublemakers in check. One way is to give them some curdled milk. Apparently, it's their favorite. And trim their hair so they can see. If that doesn't work, you can call in a witch doctor to use some good old-fashioned magic to exercise them away. Now, according to South African folklore, these tokoloshes are mostly invisible and can suck on a stone to stay that way. So, if you want to keep them away from your home, scatter some special blessed salts, aka tokolosha salts, along your door frames and windowsills. Or if you're feeling extra cautious, put some bricks under your bed's legs. Better safe than sorry, right? Have you heard of the Chimera? She's a total monster, literally. This fire-breathing female hybrid is made up of all sorts of animal parts. Think lion-like body, goat-like head, and a tail that ends in a snake's head. According to Greek mythology, the Chimera is the child of Typhon and Echidna, and her sisters are Cerberus and Lernaean Hydra. Sounds like a family reunion, huh? But don't worry, our hero Bellerophon was up for the challenge. The King of Lycia sent him on a mission to defeat the fearsome Chimera. And Bellerophon was the greatest hero monsters were scared of. The Chimera was no match for Bellerophon and his trusty Pegasus. Even though the King was secretly hoping the Chimera would take out Bellerophon instead, in the end, justice prevailed and the Chimera was defeated. Well, that's it for today.